Welcome back to the Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, coming to you from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen FNC. True story. Yesterday, I transferred a large sum of money from one bank account to another with the expectation that very shortly thereafter, I was going to wire that money to an eBay seller in London who was auctioning off 17 original Beatles acetate recordings. The seller told me he had locked up a buyer for all 17 of these super rare discs for 25,000 British pounds, or roughly $40,000. But that said buyer had consented to allow the seller to sell to me for the aforementioned large sum of money one of these acetates that I, as a lifelong Beatles freak and collector of their musical rarities, coveted intensely. At the last minute, jolted into propriety and wishing to remain married, I climbed off the ledge and transferred the money back to its original account. This, ladies and gentlemen, was not only a latter-day flash of Beatlemania, but evidence of another kind of mania, equally alluring, all-consuming, and dangerous, namely the passion many of us harbor for collecting things. Today's visitor to the foxhole brings us a similar story of a man's intense passion for the works of a particular artist and his determination to lay his hands on hugely important and expensive tokens of that art. Andrea Mays is a trained economist who teaches economics at California State University at Long Beach. And she is the author of her first book, The Millionaire and the Bard, Henry Folger's Obsessive Hunt for Shakespeare's First Folio, published this month by Simon & Schuster. Andrea, welcome to the Foxhole. Thank you. All right, so The Millionaire and the Bard. We're pretty sure we know who the Bard is. That's William Shakespeare, considered by many to be the finest practitioner of the English language uh, in recorded history and considered by still others to be a distant forerunner to the Beatles. Um, who is Henry Folger, the millionaire? Henry Folger was a late 19th century Brooklynite, born into, uh, not into wealth. His father was a millinery supplier. He went to prep school in Brooklyn, went to Amherst College. His father had financial difficulties while Henry was at, at Amherst, and through one of his classmates, he arranged a loan that allowed him to finish school. When he finished school, he went to work for this same classmate's dad as a clerk at an oil company in Brooklyn while he took uh, law school classes at, at night from Columbia Law School. And that was the first rung on his climb to be the head of the largest company in the world. Which was what? Which, well, at the, the oil company he worked for was taken over by Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. And with John D. Rockefeller at the head, Henry became the secretary to the Manufacturing Committee, which was the, basically the policy-making board of Standard Oil Company. And then he worked his way up to be secretary of the committee. Then he was a chairman of the committee. And at the very end of the story, with the antitrust case against Standard Oil in 1911, the remedy of the court was to break the company into many different pieces. The second largest piece was Standard Oil of New York, which Henry Folger was tapped to be the head of. So that was sort of the pinnacle of his career at Standard Oil was he was the president and then later chairman of Standard Oil of New York. And he died when? He died in 1930, unfortunately, just a few weeks after ground had been broken on his major project building his library in Washington, D.C. Okay, and tell us about that library before we proceed further. Sure. Uh, Henry and his wife Emily collected over 30 years anything you can imagine that is related to Shakespeare, uh, literally anything you can imagine. Any story that you know from Shakespeare and you say, oh, there was this case of a forgery, they've got you know, information on it there, or they've got the confession, the original confession, they've got a vicar who questioned whether Shakespeare actually existed, well, the Folger owns his diary. And then sort of the cornerstone of the collection was um, this uh, accumulation of copies of a particular book that we can talk about a little bit. Yes. Um, at some point, uh, Henry spoke with one of his uh, scholar friends who recommended to him, why don't you build a library? This would be a great idea, you know, show it to the public, share with scholars all this material that you have. So he decided uh, that this is what he was going to do. Eventually, he bought land in Washington, D.C. He considered building it in New York, but New York was too expensive for him to afford real estate given the modest endowment of $10 million that he thought it would have. 
Uh, that and wouldn't even get you above 14th Street today. Just that would the, not. Okay. And especially, he was trying to buy property in close to where the Frick Museum is in the 70s on Fifth Avenue. No, no chance of doing that. So he, he tried to come in under $2 million total, and he was able to do that in Washington. He would not have been able to do that in New York. How much of your research for this book uh, came from the Folger Library, or did you do there? Uh, the Folger Library includes the archive of every bit of paper that uh, Henry Folger left behind. And he was, aside from collecting Shakespeare, he never apparently threw anything out. I have little bits of paper, sketches that he made on hotel stationery, little notes that he wrote to himself on hotel stationery in West Virginia. Um, it's all at the Folger Library. There's also a Standard Oil archive in Texas, at the University of Texas Ransom Center. And then there's a uh, Rockefeller archive in uh, Pecanico in, in New York State. And I went to all three of those. All right, so where along in his life did Henry Folger develop this obsessive interest in Shakespeare? I don't know exactly when the obsession began. He started studying Shakespeare in college and it it was about the time that Shakespeare was really beginning to be considered as an academic subject. Prior to that, really, he'd not been studied that way. He went to see a speech by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was quite aged at the time, and he was moved by the speaker, and he said, well, let me go check out what else he's written about. And he had written a, a hagiography of, of Shakespeare, and he I think Folger took this to heart and was motivated and said, okay, there's something really important in these plays. I should really read them closely. And he did for the rest of his life. So he began collecting the things, the books, um, in 1889 is really his first big acquisition. He goes into an auction house called Bangs in New York, and he buys not a first folio, but a fourth folio, which was cheaper, and that was what he could afford. He was just out of school. He didn't have savings. He still had this loan left to pay off. So he bought this book for $107.50 and put that on layaway, sort of, paid for it over time. And that was really the, the beginning of the, of the quest. And then as he made more money at Standard, he bought more. And he, as he bought Standard stock and he earned the generous dividends from that, he bought more materials. He and his wife shared that uh, desire to own all this Shakespeareana. So he didn't have the same problem of having to turn back out from a purchase. Emily was 100% behind it. Our visitor in the foxhole today is Andrea Mays, economics professor at Cal State Long Beach and author of The Millionaire and the Bard, Henry Folger's Obsessive Hunt for Shakespeare's First Folio, published this month by Simon & Schuster. Uh, what are your thoughts about collecting as a, I don't even know if we should call it properly, a discipline or a pursuit? Let's, that's the most neutral word I could think of. What are your thoughts about collecting as a pursuit? Is it, as my wife likes to say of me, evidence of a disorder, mm -hmm. uh, ipso facto? Or what, how, how do we consider collecting? Well, that, that's a tough question because there's probably a very fine line and you as a collector don't know when you have crossed it. That's part of the problem. Uh, Henry Folger had a little easier time of it because his wife shared the obsession. So if, you, if, if a man collected um, uh, contemporary magazines and stacked them up along the walls of the house until you could only wind your way through, and we call him, you know, we might say he has concessive, obsessive compulsive disorder and that this is something, you know, a, a problem for him in his, in his everyday life. Uh, Henry and Emily Folger collected amazing amounts of material. Somehow she got him to uh, store them, not at their house, but in warehouses. So starting in the late 19th century and for 30 years, they paid storage fees on warehouse rooms, room after room after room. They would buy materials examine them, have them in their house, then bring them down to the basement, wrap them up, and then put them into a wooden case, ship it off to a warehouse with the intention eventually of putting it into their library. So the materials that they acquired, uh, he kept careful inventory of, she kept careful inventory of, they knew what they had, but they never saw it all together. So um, for an obsessive collector, 
if you don't see it right in front of you, you might have the temptation to say, okay, well, I've got this record here that I have this book, but you know, this copy might be a little better or it's a little different and I want to get that one too. And, and he had the pocketbook to be able to do all of that, to indulge that. But whether you're collecting on Henry Folger's level, where crossing the line is going to be a distinctly greater possibility because you're not obstructed by any financial hindrance, right? Or whether you're collecting at my level, or whether you're a boy collecting this year's Topps baseball cards, let's say, or Pokemon cards, mm -hmm. like my son collects. Um, is there, from where you sit, uh, a, a mania at work, no matter who we're talking about, because there's, it, in essence, it's an attempt to impose order on the randomness of the universe, correct? It, it is. Uh, it's also a way of framing the rest of your life, that you, you th see it all through the lens of this Shakespeareana or if you're a Lincoln collector through the Lincoln objects that you own. That kind of besotted individual. That, that's correct. Um, but uh, I, would, I would roll back one thing that you said, which was um, that he didn't face any of the financial constraints. Henry Folger, like the other collectors that I know and one that I live with, uh, is a master of brinksmanship, financial brinksmanship. So although he had quite a generous salary at Standard Oil, uh, $50,000 when he was president and then $100,000 when he was chairman of the board. He spent that on a single book in a year. Mm, he owned a lot of, of uh, standard stock, very generous dividends from that, and yet there is voluminous paperwork about uh, related to the loans that he took out. So he would use standard stock as collateral, borrow money against it, and then buy books with that. And then buy more standard stock, borrow money, and then buy something else. So he would have hundreds of uh, IOUs essentially from the, from the banks and from individuals, from the firm, uh, so that he could manage, oh, I've got this $30,000 book that I need to get. I need 20,000 more to be able to make that happen. Let me shuffle this around here and shuffle that around there. Um, the, the, the ultimate tribute to that is that when his estate um, was described in the New York Times, um, one of the things that they looked at was that Emily's estate consisted primarily of IOUs from Henry, who had borrowed from her to be able to buy the books. Our visitor in the foxhole today is Andrea Mays, economics professor at Cal State Long Beach and author of The Millionaire and the Bard, Henry Folger's Obsessive Hunt for Shakespeare's First Folio, published this month by Simon & Schuster. We, we've, we've conducted this discussion to this point, I think, without properly informing our viewers and listeners of what the first folio was. First folio was the first authorized collected works, or excuse me, collected plays of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare died in 1616. He was, had been retired to Stratford for a few years already. Uh, he had stopped writing plays. About half of his plays had been published in his lifetime, leaving well, some of the biggies, uh, The Tempest, Macbeth, uh, Twelfth Night, Julius Caesar, unpublished. And given what we know about the times, about half of the plays that we know of from that era disappeared. They, plays were not typically published in part because the theater companies owned essentially the script and they didn't want other theatrical companies to get hold of them and then go out into the hinterlands and perform them without paying them any royalties. So they kept everything very secret. The, the theater companies kept things very secret. Uh, after after um, Shakespeare's death, two of his friends, fellow actors and fellow shareholders in the Globe Theater Company, businessmen, decided to get together and, as a memorial to their friend, collect all of the manuscripts that they had available to them, plus the published copies of the plays, and published this single volume of the of Shakespeare, 36 of Shakespeare's plays. The, the, the word folio is a term of art in printing that essentially means you take the single large piece of paper that would be put on a printing press and you would fold it only once. So you'd have something like an encyclopedia-sized volume. And what made it unusual was Plays were not considered high art. They were not literature. Shakespeare was not something that you read with your pinky up. This was really entertainment for the masses. Although the king and queen enjoyed them, uh, this was really something written for the, the populace. And uh, uh, the, the 
idea of putting these plays into a folio format gave it a lot of dignity that heretofore plays had not had. Prior, how, how many copies were produced? We think about 750 copies were produced. So w there's a law that would have limited the number of copies absolutely to 1,500, but because of economic considerations, how many copies do you have to sell to break even and so on, they probably printed about 750. And by the time Henry Folger uh, began collecting Shakespeareana, how many of those 750 copies were believed to exist at that point? Oh, around 100. There was a, a census that was published in 1903 where an English uh, Shakespeare scholar attempted to track down all the owners of the known copies. Many of them were institutional, many of them were private and very hard to find. Some of them, like Henry Folger, were very secretive and didn't want to share information about what they had. But uh, somewhere around 100 when he began. And then by the time he died, he owned 82 of the known about 153 copies. Auction prices pushed the price so high that a lot of people started looking in their libraries, hmm, maybe I have one of those in my library too. And so today we know of about, we know of exactly 244 copies that are, that are known still to exist. So even, even now, uh, not quite a century later, uh, he, he still has a good chunk of uh, known copies known to exist in the world. When was the last time that a previously undiscovered first folio was discovered? Last summer, a copy was discovered at a Jesuit university in France. And they weren't sure quite what they had, and they called on the world's leading experts on first folios, um, Eric Rasmussen and Anthony James West, who verified that in fact what they had was a first folio. So last summer was number 244. You write in The Millionaire and the Bard, and I quote, Henry had done it. After four years of torturous and delicate negotiations with a quixotic, temperamental, and indecisive seller, after infinite patience and indefatigable persistence, and after, of course, spending a great deal of money, the folio was his. As the most expensive book in the world, it was more costly than even the finest copy of the much rarer Gutenberg Bible, of which only 50 copies have been printed on vellum. Henry and Emily decided to make a triumphant trip to England to carry the Vincent copy home. His purchase of the Vincent copy signaled his breakthrough as a great collector. He had learned the price of hesitation and quibbling. He had overcome the psychological hurdle that all beginning collectors confront, spending big money. Some collectors do not obtain their finest pieces until the summit of their careers. Folger achieved many of his greatest triumphs at the dawn of his quest. This was his seventh first folio. Some collectors lose great objects because they take too long to hit their stride. They lack the confidence to recognize opportunities or the will to act decisively, even when they could afford the piece. They possess the financial resources, but not the will to deploy them. Great opportunities come too early in their careers and they do not act. They fail to realize that falling stars are rare, that planets rarely align. Henry learned these lessons early in the game. The Vincent acquisition reaffirmed Henry's faith in the free market and his belief in an inexorable economic truth. Despite unyielding pride, elaborate manners, a feigned indifference to wealth, and a pose of cultural superiority, an English gentleman could, in the end, once tempted with enough money, usually be induced to part with his treasures. Um, when did the first folios, or the first of the first folios, make their way to the United States. You, you noted that this was an English seller. Um, when was the first time that an American was selling a copy of the first folio? Oh, selling? I don't know. Or even possessing? Uh, possessing uh, a late 18th century. Okay, so, yeah. they, so they made their way across the they pond fairly early They made their way uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Not many copies, though. And in fact, uh, if, if you look at uh, sort of a timeline of what has happened to the folios, folios that is really essentially what's happened is even beginning at the, as early as the end of the 18th century, uh, you see the folios flowing across the Atlantic. That changed a little bit in the 20th century when some copies started going to Asia. I mean, there's certainly copies all, all over the place, um, but uh, there was a migration towards Asia as well. But most of it has been to the United States. Um, there is around Shakespeare as a figure a certain controversy that endures centuries later. Uh, wherein we see scholars of different stripes maintaining that uh, 
uh, Shakespeare didn't really write the works attributed to him, or that Shakespeare was actually somebody else, Christopher Marlowe perhaps, or in fact that Shakespeare was for women, or we see all kinds of different right. theories circulating. Uh, do, you, uh, do you take any position in those sort of theological debates about Shakespeare? I do. Uh, you want to know what it is? Yes, <laughs> My position is Shakespeare wrote the plays. He wrote the plays. So we have a lot of um, uh, evidence as to Shakespeare's existence at the time. We have evidence of his performing in plays. We have evidence of his being a playwright. The English were meticulous record keepers. And we have, uh, there's a, an official uh, whose job title I envy called the Master of the Revels, who would keep track of performances at court and also was in charge of censoring plays if they contained materials that were not suitable for performance. He would say, oh no, you have to cut that out. And then he would have to give his seal of approval before you could perform in London. Well, we have uh, dozens and dozens of examples where Shake uh, performed this play by William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So there's no question that there were plays that were written by him. Or attributed to him. Or attributed to him, right. So it could have been, um, as some have suggested, that someone else wrote them and he just took the credit for it. There's a, an early pamphlet that was published in the late 1590s by a, another playwright who on his deathbed wanted to, to diss this William Shakespeare and called him an upstart crow dressed in borrowed clothes, uh, essentially saying he was getting above himself being such a popular playwright because he had no university degree like the rest of this group of playwrights did. So we, we know already that at least one contemporary playwright was jealous enough of him to write about it on his deathbed and try to criticize Shakespeare for not having a university degree. I was just going to ask you about the movie Amadeus Hmm. where you recall that the main character is not Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, but a, a com contemporary composer uh, named Salieri, who uh, essentially existed in Mozart's shadow and, and was bitter about that. Right. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, and, there, and to this day you'll find people who exalt Salieri as the greater composer and that sort of thing, and I wondered if there were contemporaries of Shakespeare whom scholars and historians regard as having perhaps been his equal in his own time. Oh yes, and, and I do as well. Uh, Christopher Marlowe, master tragedian, absolutely master at writing tragedy. Uh, Marlowe died at age 29 in strange circumstances around which there's also a conspiracy. He might have been assassinated, um, but he was stabbed in the head in a, a bar brawl in Deptford outside London. Uh, he certainly was Shakespeare's equal. Uh, ben Jonson, also contemporary of Shakespeare's, master comedian, comic writer. My, the first play I ever saw of The Arrow was Volpone by Ben Jonson. Um, others who were excellent, John Webster, Fletcher, Beaumont, Massinger, uh, there are many other contemporary writers who are extremely talented, some of whose plays we actually see performed still. The difference is Shakespeare did it all. He did. Marlowe did history as well, but Shakespeare did history, tragedy, comedy, romance. He did it all. He was just a master. And did Shakespeare leave behind anything uh, in the way of prose autobiographical writings? Not a single line. To this date, we know of six words written in Shakespeare's hand. And we, we assume that they're written in his hand. They're signatures on legal documents. So we have uh, three signatures of his, including on his will and on a, a, a property document. But no, not a single line of poetry, not a single line of prose, not a grocery list, not a letter to his wife, nothing. That's not that unusual. It's not that unusual. If you look back at Johnson and Marlowe and Lily and Robert Greene, and there, there are not you know, voluminous archives of their handwritten manuscripts either. You've got a major review of this book coming up very soon. Tell us where that is and, and who's writing it. Uh, Stephen Greenblatt, who wrote a magnificent book called Will of the World, is reviewing my book next Sunday in the New York Times book That's review. fantastic. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. This was your first book, correct? Yes. What was the hardest part for you? Ooh, aside from coming up with the idea, that, that took a while. Uh, the footnotes were probably the hardest part. 
keeping track of, I probably read a thousand letters that Henry Folger wrote back and forth, both to friends, book dealers, relatives. Uh, it was hard to keep track of that. And we should point out for the benefit of our viewers that Professor Mays uh, is the better half of a previous visitor to the foxhole, James Swanson, the author who has tackled such subjects as the uh, Lincoln assassination and the Kennedy assassination and is esteemed a historian in his own right. Uh, did it make it easier or harder for you to write this book, Living with James? Much easier. Much <laughs> easier. Uh, he, w he was very helpful in, in a number of things. One was when I first considered writing a proposal for a book, he said, write about something you love because you don't want to be writing about being inhabiting a topic for two or three or four years that you don't like. So that was really good advice to begin with. Mm -hmm. He also said, write about something you know something about already so you're not starting from square one. That was also good advice. He said, well, what, you know, what are the things that you know? You know about math, you know about science, you know about Shakespeare. Try to find one of those subjects and, and make that the subject of your, of your first book, and that was very good advice. So you're going to keep him? I am going to keep All him. Right. I am going to keep him. Our visitor in the foxhole today has been Andrea Mays, economics professor at Cal State Long Beach and author of The Millionaire and the Bard, Henry Folger's Obsessive Hunt for Shakespeare's First Folio, published this month by Simon & Schuster and very soon to be the subject of a rave review in the New York Times book review section. That'll do it for this episode of The Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, signing off from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen FNC, and we will FNC you next time. Thank you.